the spreadsheet going for the notes. It's taken its uh, its dear time. Um, but I've heard I've heard that there was apparently in at least there's there's two different Mask of the Phantasm novelizations. Uh, the one we're reading is by Andrew Helfer, and the other one is yeah okay that's my email I got it. Um, and the other one is written by um, Gary Gary Gravel Gary Grevel something like that. He wrote a couple other Batman the Animated Series novels um, that combine multiple episodes of the show together into, like, one succinct story. Uh, like, I want to say... I want to say that he mixed together, like, Robin's Reckoning and Appointment in Crime Alley or something along those lines. And then there was one he did with Two-Face that mixed together the, the Two-Face origin and i think shadow of the bat something something like that i don't i don't remember the specifics but we're not doing that guy we're doing andrew helfer uh because that's the one that i have in my um in my physical possession uh hello maddie i'm here because it's thursday hell yeah that's also why i'm here for some reason the chats are coming through on the on the little screen there but they're not coming through on my stream chat thing so i'm not sure What's going on there? Uh, I mean, up to the good job Robin did come through on the on the regular. I don't know, but I'll try to I'll try to keep up with the teeny tiny, um, the teeny tiny version that's coming through. Uh, but yeah, I guess let's go ahead. Let's jump into chapter three. Um, I'm gonna hit the borrow for an hour button and wait for it to load the borrowed version. I guess. Where did, while that's going, I'll find chapter three in my book. Damn, it's taking its time. Oh. I guess it had to refresh the page. We had issues at work, so I am actually here for Maddie's book stream for the first time ever on Twitch. Well, there you go. I'm glad you're able to be here with us today, Bob. Uh Oh, it's going to load exactly where we were last time. That's good. And we are in the A flat, one of the flashbacks now. 10 years ago, in a strange way, Bruce Wayne found the cemetery comforting. After 4 years of constant study in college, he'd recently returned to Gotham City. Hmm. Okay. Now he was faced with an endless stream of parties, dinners, and get-togethers that never allowed him a moment's peace. Bruce Wayne knew what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. He just wasn't sure how he was going to do it. And with all the social engagements he'd been subjected to, he doubted he would ever have enough time to himself to figure it out. So he decided to come here whenever he could, to stand before the grave of his mother and father, pay his respects, and silently ask for their advice. As he laid a pair of roses at the foot of the grave, he heard a woman's voice nearby. That's right, the woman said, and if daddy gets any, any more protective, I might as well join the young Republicans. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, <laughs> Bruce turned to see a woman standing a short distance away. Her back was to Bruce, and since there was no one else there, Bruce could only conclude that the woman was talking to herself. Bruce stepped closer as she continued. It's times, it's times like this I wish you were around to... She stopped suddenly and turned to face Bruce. Yes, she inquired. Excuse me, Bruce stammered. He was struck by her beauty. I thought you were saying something. To me, I mean. No, the woman answered, then turned abruptly away. Well, okay, Bruce said uncomfortably. He'd interrupted something and figured he'd better leave. Oh, now they're now that the chats are coming back through. That's interesting. I don't know what happened there. Batman Mask of the Phantasm, narrated by Maddie Washburn. Yes. Is the is is that big enough for y'all to read along? Do I need to do I need to make it bigger? Let me let me do it just uh just to be on the safe side. There we go. Uh from the corner of her eye, the woman spotted Bruce walking off. A mischievous gleam appeared in her eye. She looked at the gravestone at her feet and smiled. 
You know who that was? She asked, just loud enough for Bruce to hear. Bruce Wayne. You know, Wayne Enterprises? I've seen him on campus. Very mute, moody. Cute, though. Bruce couldn't help himself. Again, he stopped to listen. And again, when she turned to face him, she looked somewhat displeased. Yes, she said. I heard my name, Bruce stammered. I thought... Who are you talking to? The woman pointed to the gravestone. My mother, she said. Oh, Bruce replied, embarrassed. I didn't mean to. That's okay, the woman said. We're done. Mom doesn't have much to say today. Bruce rolled his eyes. This was too much. The woman noticed the gesture and frowned. Hey, she said. I'm not the only one who talks to their loved ones, you know. I didn't say anything. Bruce said defensively. When she started walking toward the cemetery parking lot, Bruce trotted to, to keep up with her. It's just that when I talk to her out loud, the woman continued, I can imagine how she'd reply. I can hear her as if she's right there. Bruce understood all too well. I talked to my parents once, he said, grow, growing solemn. I made a vow, a secret vow. Now it was the woman's chance to roll her eyes. Ooh, she purred with a touch of sarcasm. A man of mystery. So, tell me, she said as she opened her car door. Have you kept your vow? Bruce rubbed his chin. So far. He smiled as the woman started the convertible's engine. In response, the woman smiled and extended her hand. Andrea Beaumont, she said. Bruce Wayne, he began. But Andrea pressed her foot to the gas and drove out of the cemetery, leaving Bruce alone. He smiled to himself at the thought of running into Andrea Beaumont again. All right, since we're at that little break, let's, uh... Oh, shoot, I didn't organize the... I didn't organize this last time because I was in such a rush. Let's add the couple of, couple of things we got. Um, let's see, we've got um, Andrea Beaumont's mother, uh, deceased... Or so we think. Um, spoilers for something that never ended up happening. Uh, but I, fuck, I, I, I always forget like what they're... Oh, not Andrea Beaumont deceased. Andrea Beaumont's mother. Oops. I always forget what their, what their actual names are. Uh, but I know we have them. He's mentioned at least. I know he'll show up later, but uh, locations. Let's put Wayne Enterprise was mentioned. Uh, but yeah, no spoilers for something that has never happened and probably will never happen. The Red Hood from uh, let's see. There was was it mentioned like what graveyard this was? No, just just cemetery. Okay. Um, the Red Hood from from the Batman Adventures Volume 2 was supposed to be Andrea Beaumont's mother, uh, who had apparently faked her death. Uh, and then we got mention of Young Republicans. I'll put that over there. Um, let's see. Mentions of time. We got... Um, Ten years ago. That's on uh, page 18. And then we got that Bruce spent four years in college. After four years of constant study in college, he returned to Gotham City. He'd recently returned to Gotham City. Uh, and that's page 18 as well. Um, so some, some continuity notes about that. Um, in Batman and Harley Quinn, Bruce mentions he uh, he dropped out of med school. Uh, 
And then even in this book itself, um, Andrea says she'd seen Bruce around campus. Which is weird like why would they both go to the same school outside of gotham um let me wrap that text oh there it is uh this is the only day of the week i read other than that it's just video games and youtube yeah basically the same for me uh, cute but moody, Batman in a nutshell, yes. Mama Beaumont didn't know the big bad wolf, but she d could still rock a red hood, yeah. And Mask of the Phantasm, we don't know what happened to Mama Beaumont, but if you see this Joker-looking dude come into your house, and the person who lives there comes home and screams, you basically get the picture. I think that was, uh, that was Daddy Beaumont. In, the, in Phantasm. We, we definitely have no clue what happened to the mom, just that she's supposed dead. Uh, that night a full moon hung in the sky over Gotham City. Conditions were perfect for Bruce to begin a trial run for what he hoped would become a career in crime fighting. Dressed in black, he used a hook and rope to swing from skyscraper to skyscraper, patrolling the city, looking for trouble. Soon he found it. Staring down onto a shipping dock from the ledge of a skyscraper, Bruce saw a group of men loading merchandise into the back of a large truck. He checked his watch. 3 a.m. It was too late at night, or too early in the morning, for normal deliveries. When he spotted a security guard tied up in the corner, Bruce knew it was time to go into action. He rolled his cap down over his face. It had two holes for his eyes and a third for his mouth. In the moonlight, he looked like a ninja warrior. As he prepared to descend from the rooftop, he hoped he would perform like one. In the alley, the three burglars continued to load merchandise into the truck. Boxes brimmed out the back of as one of them raised a walkie-talkie to his lips. Okay, Skaz, he said. We're done shopping. Oh, let me turn the page. At the, at the mouth of the alley, the burglar named Skaz stood watch. All clear here, he responded. Then let's blow this pop stand. The first burglar said as he joined his two partners at the back of the truck. They were just about to close the truck's rear doors when they had a, heard a piercing cry from above. They looked up as a man dressed in black hurl, hurtled down toward them. He landed with the thud on the top of the truck, then d dived off the roof and somersaulted to the ground. Bruce took a battle stance as he confronted the three burglars. On your stomachs, he demanded. Arm spread! Who is this clown? One of the burglars asked. The first burglar put out, pulled out a crowbar and slapped it menacingly against his open palm. You heard Mr. Kung Fu, boys, he smirked. Yeah, I'm shaking, said the second burglar as he and the third raised their guns and began to circle around Bruce. In response, Bruce pulled a pair of ninja throwing stars out of his belt and tossed them at the two bur gun-toting burglars. The stars struck the burglar's hands, knocking their guns away. Get him! The burglar with the crowbar screamed as he charged toward Bruce. As the crowbar swung past, Bruce ducked under the burglar and smashed him in the jaw, knocking him out cold. But Bruce's job was far from over. The second burglar crept up behind Bruce and grabbed him in a bear hug, while the third punched Bruce hard in the stomach. Bruce's body went limp. The burglar holding him tried to lift Bruce so his partner could take another swing, but just as he'd succeeded in lifting Bruce to his feet, Bruce jerked his head back into the burglar's face. The burglar hit the ground with a thud. Two down, one to go, Bruce thought as the final burglar charged toward him. Bruce could see the murderous rage in the thug's eyes and knew he could use that to his advantage. Rage made a man careless and cocky. Anger dulled his reaction time. Sure enough, the burglar rushed forward, swinging wildly, and Bruce had no trouble knocking him out. Bruce took a deep breath as he looked over the unconscious men around him. He smiled broadly. He'd done it! He'd stopped three criminals, and it was a piece of cake! 
Bruce turned toward the security guard, who lay tied up near the warehouse entrance. But as he began to loosen the gag, covering the guard's mouth, Bruce noticed the panic in her eyes. The guard was looking over Bruce's shoulder. Bruce turned as Skaz, the burglar who had been guarding the alley, sprayed machine gun fire toward Bruce. Bruce rolled, pulling the guard out of the path of the bullets. Skaz turned and jumped into the truck's cab. His buddies might be down for the count, Skaz thought, but that wouldn't prevent him from making a bundle on this haul. Skaz started the engine and pulled the truck out of the alley. He smiled to himself. Soon he'd be rich. It hadn't been such a bad night after all. Skaz was so busy thinking about how he was going to spend his money, he didn't realize the truck's back door had been left ajar. As the truck picked up speed, boxes began tumbling out the back and crashing into the street. Skaz also didn't notice that someone was chasing the truck, ducking out of the path of the boxes as they fell. Before the truck could escape him, Bruce leaped toward it, managing to grab onto one of the swinging doors. Each time the truck turned, more boxes spilled out, narrowly missing Bruce. Slowly, Bruce began pulling himself up, but before he could get inside, the truck passed a patrolling police car. Skaz kept his cool. Passing a police car was nothing for him to worry about. As far as he was concerned, he looked just like any other trucker with a late night delivery to make. But Skaz didn't know about the man dangling from the back of the truck, which alerted the cops to the fact that something was very wrong. When the police turned on the siren and took off after the truck, Skaz glanced at the rearview mirror nervously. What could have tipped them off? He wondered. When the truck's rear door swung into view and Skaz saw the man dangling from it, he was stunned. He thought he had got rid of that creep back at the warehouse. The police car pulled up alongside the truck and the cops inside motioned for Skaz to pull over. When Skaz refused, the police car pulled ahead, hoping to cut the truck off. As soon as it was in front of the truck, Skaz stepped on the gas. Wham! The police car shuddered at the at the bleh, as the truck rammed it from the rear oh what was that sound hey congo wonga 98 subscribed with prime thank you it's very nice of you uh wham the truck hit the police car again the car swerved sideways kicking up smoke as it tipped onto its side the truck smashed into the underside of the police car effortlessly brushing it out of its path leaving the cops inside helpless Bruce watched the police car shrink in the distance. Now it was all up to him, but he'd lost the advantage of surprise. Skaz knew he was there. As the truck hurtled to along the highway, Bruce finally managed to climb to the roof and crawl across the length of it. Then he stepped down onto the top of the cab as the truck entered the Gotham Tunnel. Bruce removed a small hammer from his belt and smashed it against the truck's windshield. Thousands of web-like lines appeared across the glass as the windshield cracked. Skaz couldn't see a thing. The truck swerved back and forth, scraping against the sides of the tunnel. Bruce was buffeted about, but he held on, determined to see this chase to its conclusion. Suddenly, Skaz jammed his foot down on the brake. The wheels locked, the truck skidded, and Bruce was thrown forward past the windshield and over the hood of the truck. Skaz saw the man dressed in black fly across the win cracked windshield. He's probably lying on the ground in front of me right now, Skaz thought. He smiled as he jammed his foot on the gas. That's the end of him, Skaz muttered as the truck rolled off. But Skaz didn't know that at the last second, Bruce had grabbed the truck's grill. Now, instead of hanging from the back of the truck, he was hanging onto its front. As the wind blew fiercely at his back, Bruce came up with a plan. Carefully, he reached into his belt and removed a handful of spiked steel balls. Then, he tossed them under the truck's wheels. Boom! The front of the tire exploded. Out of control, the truck swerved and tipped onto its side. Skaz was instantly knocked out, but Bruce was still conscious and hanging onto the grill for his life. The truck skidded along the road for what seemed like forever. Finally, it slowed to a halt. Bruce br Bruce breathed a sigh of relief as he let go of the grill. 
He tried to stand up, but something held him in place. He craned his neck around and realized the truck had come to rest just inches away from the side of the building. If the truck had skidded just another foot, Bruce would have been crushed. Instead, as he heard the sound of sirens approaching, Bruce managed to squirm free. Before the police arrived, Bruce had climbed up the wall of a nearby building and run off. The way he had handled himself tonight, he wasn't ready to reveal himself to anyone. Alright, so let's see. So we got Skaz and his gang were added in. Oh, there's an H there at the end of gang. That's not supposed to be there. Get rid of that. And then we got, um, specifically mentioned, we got the Gotham Tunnel. Uh, that was capitalized as if it's a, the name of the place. Um, and then we got a mention of time that it's like 3 a.m. Uh, yeah, he checked his watch 3 a.m. And that was on page 21. That's basically it for that section. Uh, what you guys got going on? Uh, the whole mom died thing is in most Disney movies and they had that in Static Shock as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that seems to be a, a common trope. Um... Oh, what is this? What are these hyper things? I don't even know what any of that means. All right. Almost done with this chapter. Let's see. I read about your anonymous exploits this morning, Alfred said as he approached Bruce with the morning's paper. And I must say, are you sure you wouldn't, you won't consider or you won't reconsider rugby? On the lawn in front of Wayne Manor, Bruce Wayne punched and kicked at the air, replaying his moves of the night before. Sorry, Alfred, he said, his bandaged face a mask of concentration. But the plan is working. I had the edge. I could feel it. He stopped and gazed intently at his faithful butler. There was only one thing wrong. They're, they weren't afraid of me. I've got to strike fear in them from the start. Alfred nodded. He understood and was about to say so when he noticed someone approaching. Pardon, Master Bruce, he said, but we may want to postpone the shop talk, as it were. I believe you have a visitor. Bruce turned to see Andrea Beaumont. Hey, what happened to you? She asked as she touched the nasty bruise on Bruce's forehead. Trip over some loose cash? Bruce turned away. He couldn't tell her what had happened last night. She'd never understand. How could anyone understand why he did these things? Without even bothering to explain, Bruce continued practicing his fight moves. Oh, I didn't turn the page for you guys. What is that? Andrea asked, stepping directly in front of Bruce. Jiu-jitsu! Bruce answered, thrusting his hand into the air. It takes years to master. Without warning, Andrea grabbed Bruce's hand and pulled it. Bruce flipped forward and crashed to the ground. Andrea smiled. Got a, few mu ugh, got a few moves of my own, she said. Bruce rubbed his head, smiling. Where did you learn? Miss Hovey's self-defense class for girls, Andrea said. She towered over him triumphantly, but not for long. Suddenly, Bruce swept his leg under Andrea's feet. Andrea fell to the ground. She was helpless. Nice footwork. Andrea smiled. Can you dance too? Bruce Wayne looked deep into Andrea Beaumont's eyes. She had all the right moves, and she had exactly the right attitude. Maybe she was the one. Maybe she could understand him. Maybe. Okay, so we got, um, let's see, we already had Alfred, yeah. So the only other mention here that's worth noting is, uh, Miss Hovey. Um, and then we've got, uh, Bruce says it takes years to master jujitsu, uh, which might help us. Uh, 
um, in the uh, in the scope of figuring out like how long he was training and everything. Uh, that's what page twenty eight. And now we're on to chapter four. I respect all the documenting you guys do. Seems like fun. Yeah, it's um, it's a lot of fun, and it, it's it's kind of why like we're able to like have as deep of lore videos as we do because like we're trying to track down all of the lore and stuff like that. I saw recently um, because I started playing the Resident Evil games um, all the way through. Uh, that there was someone who, like, went out of his way to, like, get a hold of, like, all, like, canon Resident Evil material, including, like, guides and stuff that came with, like, replica props and everything, and has has made, like, a t over the last 10 years, made a 2,700-page, uh, like, Resident Evil lore timeline. And, like, I would love to do that for the DCAU. It's just they constantly put things into flux with stuff like Batman the Adventures Continues, knocking out other stuff. Um, at this point, I'm starting to think that it might be easiest to uh, document it all as a multiverse somehow. But I don't, I don't know specifically how to, how to make that work. Uh, let's see. I'm glad he doesn't have to say the cheesy gag. There's nothing fun about jujitsu. Uh, you know, in that scene, uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but in that scene, there is, like, a couple frames where Andrea goes from wearing a sleeveless dress to a long-sleeved dress, and it always throws me off every time that I watch it. Um, let's see, let's hop into, let's hop into chapter four. We got plenty of time. In the darkened study... Uh, Bruce looked at the portrait of his parents and thought about Andrea Beaumont. Ten years ago, he mused. It seems like only yesterday. Alfred knocked on the study door and entered, clearing his throat to get Bruce's attention. Excuse me, sir, he said, but Miss Bombie is dancing on the piano. Bruce turned from the painting and sighed. Time to play the millionaire playboy again, he thought. He straightened his tie, pressed back his hair, and followed Alfred out of the study and back to the party in progress. The Gotham City Cemetery was about as far from Wayne Manor as you could get and still be inside the Gotham City limits. As lively as Wayne Manor was tonight, uh, that was how dead this place was. At least, that was when Buzz Bronski thought, uh, that was what Buzz Bronski thought as his limousine entered the cemetery grounds. Bronski had come to the cemetery to pay his respects to an old friend and business associate. The, me the friend had met a tragic end just a few days before at the hands of Batman. Buzz felt guilty for... Jesus, my nose is just itchy today. I think it's something to do with uh, my cat allergies. I, I, don't, I don't think that I've cleaned all the cat hair off of this beanie that I'm wearing. I might just take it off. <sighs> Uh, Bronski had come to the cemetery to pay his respects to an old friend and business associate. The friends had met at a, uh, the friend had met a tragic end just a few days before at the hands of Batman. Buzz felt guilty for missing his pal Chucky Saul's funeral, but it was just too dangerous for him to be seen there. Who knew, uh, who knew who might have been there to scope out underworld types like himself? The press, the cops, the feds, even the bat. Better to visit poor old Chucky one-on-one. -on -one. Nobody snoops on you at two in the morning. Still, just to be on the safe side, Buzz had brought a, f a pair of bodyguards along for the ride. As he opened the car door, one of them handed Buzz a wreath and a flashlight. You guys wait here, Buzz said as he walked off. This would only take a minute. Soon, Buzz found the gravestone. He stared at it a moment, then looked at the wreath in his hand. Chucky, Chucky, he sighed as he tossed the wreath at the stone. You always were such a loser. Then he returned to the path that led back to his car. He had only walked a few steps when he heard something. Not a voice exactly, but a sound that seemed to drift in on the wind. He listened. Uh, it sounded like his name. Startled, Buzz spun around and shining his flashlight over the dozens of gravestones littering the field about him. 
No one there, just an old hoot owl staring at him through the darkness. Buzz was relieved. The last thing he needed was to come face to face with Batman. He turned back on, onto the path and was confronted by a roiling cloud of smoke. He stared at it, frozen with fear. Buzz Bronski, the voice re repeated as the cloud parted before him. Your angel of death awaits. A steel-tipped hand swiped through the remainder of the smoke, revealing the eerie figure of Phantasm. The ghostly being stepped toward Buzz Bronski. Get away from me, you freak! Buzz shouted as he stepped back and turned to flee in terror. Deeper and deeper into the cemetery, Buzz ran, tripping over gravestones and staggering through twisting mazes of gnarled tree branches. He had to put some distance between him and the cloud of smoke that followed him until he could think of some way to defend himself. Soon he found it, or more precisely, he tripped over it. As he fled the skull-faced creature, Buzz crashed into a dirt-filled wheelbarrow. As he fell, his flashlight flew out of his hand. It hit the ground and shattered. Even though he knew it wouldn't do him any good, Buzz groped along the ground to retrieve it. Then in the moonlight, he spotted a deadly-looking pickaxe. He grabbed it and kneeled behind the wheelbarrow, waiting for the phantasm to appear before him. Time to pay for your sins, Mr. Bronski. <clears throat> a voice suddenly spoke out. Buzz gulped. The voice was coming from behind him. <clears throat> Buzz stood perfectly still for a moment. Then, in one motion, he lifted the pickaxe high over his head, spun around, and charged toward the sound of the voice. Phantasm was ready for him. As the pick came sailing down, Phantasm swiped at a hand blade through the air. It connected with the pick, slicing it in half. The metal end sailed through the air, leaving Bronski holding a harmless stump of wood. Again, Phantasm started to float toward the helpless gangster. You always were a loser, Mr. Bronski, Phantasm said as Bronski ran deeper into the cemetery. Oh, I just realized I didn't move the page over for you guys kind of just got into it he had no pickaxe no flashlight nothing to help him either defend himself or escape we're down here if you're following along uh he squinted in the moonlight all around him were gravestones and statues or were they statues could one of them be phantasm was he about to run smack into his attacker buzz bronski wasn't sure of anything anymore the only thing he was certain of was that he was standing on solid ground and then that gave way too Buzz Bronski fell a total of six feet. His soft face slapped against mud when he landed. He was frightened. He was dazed. He had absolutely no idea where he was. And then he looked up. He was inside an eight-foot-long rectangular hole. On the ground above one end, an eight-foot-tall marble angel looked down on him. Buzz gasped in horror and he, as he staggered back to the other end of the hole. He'd fallen into an empty grave. He was about to reach up to try to lift himself out when a cloud of smoke began billowing across the ground above him. He held his breath as the image of Phantasm formed out of the smoke on the far side of the grave. Phantasm looked down on Bronski, but said nothing there or but said nothing. There was no need. Bronski knew his goose was cooked. In desperation, he turned and ran the short distance to the end of the grave where the statue stood. He reached up to the edge of the uh, to the edge of the grave and began clawing at the earth, trying to grab hold of anything that would help get him out. Clods of mud came loose from uh, 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 clods of mud came loose from under the statue's base as Bronski tried to scramble up the wall, and still Phantasm did nothing. The ghostly creature just stood there as the thought as as though waiting for something to happen. Bronski continued trying to paw his way out of the hole, but it was no use. All he'd succeeded in doing was digging away the dirt around the base of the statue. He looked back toward Phantasm at the opposite end of the grave, but Phantasm had disappeared yet again. This time, however, Phantasm quickly reappeared next to the statue. Farewell, Mr. Bronski, Phantasm said before vanishing in a cloud of smoke. Bronski scratched his head, confused. 
That's it? He wondered. That ghoul's gonna leave me in a grave? Bronski chuckled to himself. Maybe Phantasm planned to starve him to death. Then Bronski noticed something strange. A finger-like stream of smoke was winding itself around the base of the stone angel. Slowly, the statue began to tilt forward. Slowly, it began to fall toward Bronski. Bronski screamed in terror as it tilted closer and closer toward him. There was nowhere to run, no place to hide. What could Buzz Bronski do? Buzz Bronski kissed the angel. A short time later, Bronski's two bodyguards came looking for their boss. After searching through the graveyard for an hour, they came upon a curious sight. A marble angel had fallen face first into an open grave. One of the bodyguards shined his flashlight into the hole, and that's when they noticed their boss. Oh man, one said as they turned away in horror. As they walked back to the car, one man spotted a shadowy figure standing next to a gnarled tree in the moonlight. He cocked his gun and began firing at it. The shadowy figure turned and fled, leaving the bodyguards to draw their own conclusions. It's the bat, one said. It's the stinking bat! Thick iron bars covered every window of the 19th century brownstone in Gotham City's fashionable Upper East Side, making it obvious that whoever owned the place wanted to keep any uninvited visitors out. A single light shined through the bars on the, follow on the morning following Buzz Bronski's death. Inside, a painfully thin old man sat in a big comfortable chair, stirring a spoon in his morning cup of tea. He reached for the morning paper as he brought the cup to his lips. The headline made his blood run cold. Second gangster slain, it screamed. The man's eyes widened with terror and recognition when he saw the photograph of Buzz Bronski. It couldn't be! His eyes darted over the page before focusing on the photo of Batman. Below, uh, below the photo was question, has Batman gone bat? The cup of tea fell from man's hand, shattering as it hit the ground. He began to wheeze and, rising from his chair, clutched his chest in pain. It was all too much. He couldn't breathe, leaning against the chair for support. He reached for the tank of oxygen resting on the floor. Then, like a man dying of thirst, he pressed the mask against his nose and lips and took big, greedy gulps of the life-saving oxygen. Soon, the tightness around his chest began to fade. Trembling, he sat back in his chair, exhausted from his ordeal, and start stared at the newspaper lying on the floor. The picture of Batman seemed larger than life. It filled up his field of vision. Sending chills down his spine, he kicked it aside and shook his head in despair. Sal Valestra was a man with a problem. All right, and that ends chapter four. Four. Let's see what we got. Um, so we got uh, the cemetery was actually named as Gotham Cemetery. So that's something. Um, let's see. We haven't had Buzz Bronski or, or Sal Valestra mentioned yet. And Miss Bambi as well. So those are our three new characters. Uh... We had a couple of mentions of time. Oh, hold on. We're in the chapter three area here. We gotta be down to this one. There we go. Let's just uh, combine that. That way I don't get myself confused. All right, so we had a couple mentions of time. We had... Um, See, Bruce once again said it was 10 years ago. And that was on page 29. We had... Uh, let's see, the friend had met a tragic end just a few days before. And that's on page 30. 
then we had ba -ba -ba, that it was like two in the morning yeah where is it better to uh nobody snoops on you at two in the morning okay there it goes nobody snoops on you at two in the morning and that's also on page 30. We had a mention of those guys had been looking for him for an hour. Right? Where was it? Uh, there it is. Let's see, after searching through the graveyard for an hour. Oh, why did, why did it act like I clicked somewhere? I wasn't even touching my mouse. And that's on page 34. And then we have the Upper East Side. Oh, hold on, did I accidentally? I did. Move those over one, there we go. It's uh, weird that, uh, weird that Velestra lives on the east side when we, we were just told about how the wolves were the scourge of the east side for years. Uh, and let's see, every window of the 19th century brownstone. Uh, so we got mention of 19th century brownstone. And that's on page 35. And then I think that's it for for that chapter. What do you guys got going on in the chat? Unfortunately, all the sexual tension of this scene is lost. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but you know, what can you do in a children's version of a novelization? I imagine it's probably still there in the Gary Greville version. Do you want to hear Maddie seduce himself? I do that all the time. The fact is that in all DCAU novelizations and comic adaptations uh, seem to get lost or seem to lose all the most adult nuances. Yeah, I could see that. Um, I think Rise of Sinzu actually added a lot of um, adult stuff to the novelization that wasn't in the uh, that wasn't in the, the the game, and I'm expecting the Gar the, the Gary Greville books to um, kind of add in. Uh, some more adult stuff as well because those books are a little bit thicker um, But like any of them any of them that are like, you know this thin It's made for children like it, It's not gonna have it all there uh, Let's see the part where the statue falls on Chucky in the movie always rubbed me the wrong way uh, Why is that I, I, I I've always thought it's a pretty decent uh, death uh pretty pretty heavy-handed i mean it kind of kind of raises the stakes of like how um how off the rails uh the phantasm is how big of a threat she is to the way that batman operates um get away from me you freak and it's the stinking bat is are two of my favorite lines from the movie those are those are pretty pretty good ones they uh they definitely uh stick out uh, had to leave for tea. What did I miss? Um, Buzz Bronski just died. Uh, someone else drinking tea, strangely enough. Yeah, <laughs> ah, pretty much. All right. Let's see. We've got this book for the next 18 minutes. Let's see if we can get through chapter five. Councilman Arthur Reeves was angry, but his anger was kind of amusing. 
Commissioner Gordon thought as the councilman paraded back and forth in the front of ugh, in front of Gordon's desk at the police headquarters. What do you mean you won't? Reeves protested. You have to go after him. Gordon shook his head. He didn't do it. He rose from his desk and slid a pile of Batman-related newspaper clippings off the desktop. It's garbage, Mr. Reeves. Gordon said as the clippings dropped into the waste paper basket. Batman does not kill. Period. On the ledge outside Gordon's office window, Batman stood and listened. He smiled to himself. Besides Alfred, there was only one man in Gotham he could depend on, and right now, Jim Gordon was doing a pretty good job of defending him. Batman listened as Gordon continued. You get him, Gordon told Reeves as he pointed toward the door. I'll have no part of it. Reeves sneered and marched out of Gordon's office. Detective Harvey Bullock and two uniformed Gotham City policemen stood waiting in the reception area outside. Reeves smiled at them as he confidently squeezed a blast of breath spray into his mouth. Well, gentlemen, he smiled. Any ideas? That night, the bat signal appeared in the sky over Gotham. By now, the sight of the signal had become familiar, both to the citizens of Gotham and to the man whose attention it was designed to attract. What was different from usual was the group of men who had lit the beacon and who were now standing atop the police headquarters waiting for Batman to appear. Or, oh, what, what was different from usual was the group of men who had lit the beacon and who were now standing atop the police headquarters waiting for Batman to appear. There we go. That's how you read that sentence. Usually, Jim Gordon alone had the authority to flip the switch and turned on the bat signal. But now Arthur Reeves and Harvey Bullock stood by the signal waiting for something to happen. Harvey Bullock glared at his watch. Ten minutes and still no sign of the bat. Reeves smiled. He'll come, he thought to himself. Sooner or later, he'll come. On the outskirts of Gotham City, Batman saw the signal. But he knew who had lit it and wasn't interested in stepping into their ambush. If they wanted to catch him, fine. But they were going to have to think up something better than this. Besides, he reasoned as the Batmobile roared away from the city toward the Gotham City Cemetery, he had more important things to do. Soon, Batman stood over the grave of Chucky Saul. He knelt down to feel the ground around the headstone. There appears to be some chemical residue on the lawn. He mused to himself as he ran his fingers over the grass. It could match the traces I found on the glass. While searching around the graveyard for other clues, Batman suddenly realized he had wandered into a familiar section of the cemetery. He walked up a short hill, his pace quickening as he realized his destination. Batman stood before the grave of his parents. His head bowed respectfully. Funny, he thought, how I always seem to come back here. He'd visited hundreds of times before, but never wearing the uh, but never wearing the costume he'd designed to wage the war on crime that he fought in his parents' name. He hoped that somehow they could see him standing here and prayed they would be proud of him. He prayed for himself, or he prayed for something else too. And an instant later, his prayers were answered. You'd think they could afford a weed eater, the woman's voice said. Sorry, mom. But the whole world's going to seed. Batman turned. Could it be? It was. Andrea Beaumont. He began to step forward, but then he caught himself. I'm not Bruce Wayne now, he thought. I'm Batman. If Andrea saw him like this. He stepped back, and as he did, his foot crunched a small branch on the ground. Startled, Andrea turned and came face to face with Batman. She raised a hand to her lips and opened her mouth to scream. She's afraid of me, Bruce realized, and why shouldn't she be? This wasn't the way he wanted it to happen. He dreamed of seeing her again, yearned to hold her, but as Bruce Wayne, not Batman. As Andrea watched in stunned silence, Batman turned and fled. Andrea ran after him, but stopped dead in her tracks when she passed a familiar gravestone. The sight of the stone was even more jarring than the sight of Batman. She looked at the name chiseled upon the face. Wayne. No, it can't be, she murmured and looked up at Batman as he disappeared over the top of the hill. Bruce? Andrea Beaumont seemed distracted as she sat down to dinner that night with Councilman Arthur Reeves at the exclusive Windows Over Gotham restaurant. 
The thing she'd seen, and worse, the thing she'd suspected, made her head spin. She was so lost in thought, she hardly re heard Reeves speak. So, I'm having the banker cut through some red tape. He says you can roll your money into a higher yield account. Andrea blinked and shook her head dream dreamily. Account? Or amount, she said. What amount? I said account. Andrea smiled sheepishly. I'm sorry, I was just reminiscing. Reeves smiled. He understood completely, or at least he thought he did. Hey, he said, that's okay. You must have a lot on your mind. He turned to scan the elegant restaurant. Remember this place? A twinkle of nostalgia brightened his eye. Sure, you, me, and Daddy used to come here all the time. How is the old guy? Reeves asked. You're still close, aren't you? Andrea smiled warmly. Closer than ever. I'm sorry he couldn't make it into town this time, Reeves said with a smile that made it clear he wasn't sorry at all. Then he reached across the table and took Andrea's hand. But then I've always wished I could have some time alone with you. Andrea glanced down at Reeves' hand, then looked at him and grinned. Well, she said, who knows what the future might bring. Across the street, from atop Gotham's cathedral's highest spire, Batman watched Councilman Reeves take Andrea Beaumont's hand. He sighed. Was it so long ago? He wondered. Memories flooded back as hard and cruel as the rain that fell from the Gotham City skies. And that's chapter five. Let's see. Did we get what did what did we what did we really get here? We got um have we had Commissioner Gordon yet? Yeah, we had Commissioner Gordon. We have Harvey Bullock. So that's all the uh, all the new characters for that um for that chapter. We did get a couple of new places. Uh, we got the, the Gotham City Police Department headquarters. Have we? We didn't have that yet, did we? No, because the, the other one we had was Gotham City Hall. So, Gotham City Police Department HQ. Um, let's see. We had the... That... Uh, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. What is it? Um, Windows over Gotham Restaurant. And then we had uh, the Gotham Cathedral. That's notes for the, the, the Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero that we did a while back. Um, let me see. I feel like there were some mentions of time somewhere. Uh, where were they? Let's see, I've got that night the bat signal appeared in the sky. I guess we can count that. And that's what, page 38. Uh, 10 minutes and still no sign of the bat. Gotta love how slow this computer goes. I'm hoping that now that my unemployment claim has been figured out after three months, that I might be able to use some of that money to, to get a better computer going on. Uh, but we'll see. Let's see. Was that all for the mentions? 
of time. I think, I think so. Yeah, I think so. And then, you know what? Let's go ahead, put it in the concrete uh, one that the bat signal is present in this chapter. Uh, since we know its absolute earliest appearance in um, the Cape and Cow conspiracy, it means this has to happen after that. But we already know that. We did the Mask of the Phantasm timeline. All right, and so that is it for chapters three, four, and five. Um, we still have seven minutes left with the, the, the rental, but that's not going to be enough to get through chapter six. Um, what y'all got going on in the, let's see, in the chat? Buzz Bronski and the rest of the crew are con men. Even Reeves is corrupt. How the hell did Andrea Beaumont find out Bruce Wayne is Batman? That one gravestone can't be a giveaway. I mean, I think I think at the very least it, it puts the thought in her head. Um, listening to Rolling Stones these days, Maddie has a very Mick Jaggery voice. That's that's an interesting uh interesting take. I was told back in the day that I sounded like um what's his face the guy from the Doors, but I'd never heard Mick Jagger. But I'll take it. Um, but yeah, so that's that's it for that's it for today. Those are we we covered three chapters. We've still got um, future Lois Lane told Andrea Beaumont Bruce was Batman. That's it. That's the one. They both share the same uh, the same the same consciences. Uh, we've we've still got twelve chapters left of this book. If we're able to go through three chapters a week, then. That gives us maybe a month left with this book. Uh, I got the voice like Jagger. Uh, but yeah, I think that the pot pie that I put in the oven before starting the stream is ready for me. And I am hungry. So I'm going to go ahead, go and eat that. Um, you all take care. And I will see you next week, uh, most likely with chapters 6 through 8. However many we can get through in, uh, in an hour. Alright, love you guys. Take care. I'll see you later.